Video equipment rental costs paid for by peep code screencasts. Okay. Well, this is scientific computing with Ruby and the GSA, which is what I told them I'd talk about. And then I decided to name the GSA something that fits better in the, in the Google space. So Tigu, you're not going to find except for if you find a lizard or me. So uh, that's the reason I changed that. So Tigo is just a lizard uh, out of South America. And I actually have, a friend of mine actually did that uh, logo for me. So we have a, a logo too. Anyway, this is me. I'm David Richards. I wrote Tigu. I've been writing software for about a dozen years or so. Um, I decided I was unhappy. So I went back to school again. This time I'm studying something called system science, which uh, is systems. So we do math and computers, uh, a lot of machine learning, um, try to understand complex systems. Uh, it's a PhD program, and um, I get to hang out with cool people and smart people, so I like it. And they teach me a lot. Um, so a friend of mine said I should use this. In God we trust, all others must bring data. <laughs> and uh, I'm finding I, I've got a lot of reason to, to figure out my data and, and, and make it useful and uh, integrate with what I'm doing with what's going on out in the outside world. And um, of course, I want to use Ruby. And I found a lot of great bindings, a lot of great tools. And I was having fun with some projects. And I decided. Well, what, what do you call it last night? It's the F word. I'll write a framework. So, uh, so what I'm building is a, a large workbench for complex systems. And it's generic in general. And it should adjust to what you're doing. If you need data, if you need to think about data, if you're working in a production environment or you have a one-off solution you're looking for, this might be a, a place to go to look for a way to work on things. Um, so, for instance, if you were doing the, um, the Netflix competition, you want that million dollars, how would you approach it? Maybe you've thought about it, maybe you haven't. You know, you sit down and it's a complex problem. We've been working on it for a while, or people have been working on it for a while. I'm registered and I've got the data and I haven't done a thing with it yet. But, uh, you know, it's a complex problem. You're, you're trying, what, the, what the idea with Netflix is, is they said, we'll pay a million dollars to anybody that can improve our recommendation system by 10%. And so they're recommending to people, you know, what's, what movies to rent. So this is basically a value add for the customers. You go to Netflix instead of Borders because they understand me. And um, so to them, it was worth a million dollars. They had rewritten their engine. And they got a 10% improvement over their last engine. And they decided to go ahead and open that up to the community. So a lot of people have signed up to, to try to work on that problem. It's very complex. The, the, the winning team right now is two computer scientists and a statistician out of Bell Labs. And they, at last count, had 107 models that they were bringing together. And they're all kind of, there's four or five different approaches they're taking on their modeling. Um, but then they're combining them in interesting ways so that they can get a you know, better performance. Um, but how would you do that you know, in Ruby, say? You know, how would you combine the models? How would you keep track of what you're working on? Um, how would you do it without doing one-off scripts all the time? And so therefore, uh, Tigu is invented to hopefully work with large data spaces in the terabytes and above um, to be able to do complex analysis integrated to, real, to, a, to a real infrastructure. In other words, you don't have to do all your transformations before you get to work. You can just get to work and then do your transformations in Ruby. Um, and then hopefully in human time, before you retire, uh, you can get your complex analysis complete. And then, then with the resources on hand at times. That's kind of the general framework of, 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 of what we'd like to work on. Um, some more concrete examples of, of things uh, I've been working on and, and um, colleagues have been working on is uh, um, there's a lady in Portland uh, who she's doing uh, just genomic, she's, she's, she's studying um, diabetes. She's doing, she's doing um, trying to figure out 
what causes, what's, what, what are the genetic causes for diabetes and, and parts of diabetes. And she had uh, some very large data sets. And she had come to our program, she did some postdoc work just to study a specific method that would help her simplify our mat models. We, we took a class just on that. It's kind of a neat little thing. And she finished the whole class and she said, this is great, but our data set is way too large for the libraries available. And so I said, well, I've been doing this other, and she gave me some of her requirements, and that's been worked in somehow. She's going to be able to work with, with her data set. Um, so the problem space is we need to be flexible. Uh, we need to deal with cost, or at least be aware of cost. We have the resources of the cost. We can integrate it with other things and then scale it, hopefully, to the size of your problem. And there are some great solutions out there. Um, does anybody know about our language, maybe everybody? Our language is a, a language uh, for statistics. Um, it's great. I love it. I write um, a lot of things, some things. I've got some code in R that I, I prefer R. Um, it does a great job. Some of the, the best statisticians in the world are writing to R. So if it's statistical in nature, um, most likely the best minds have already solved your problem, and it's going to be there. And you can include the libraries, and it's great. Um, MATLAB, Mathematica, Maple, um, Octave, some incredible solutions. Um, they're very flexible. Most of them have languages integrated. Um, they work well. They scale. Sometimes cost is a bit of a problem that some of these are commercial. Um, a lot of your engineering labs will use MATLAB as the, um, as the default. Uh, Mathematica is a lot of fun. It was written by um, Wolfram. I was going to say Wolf, and I knew that wasn't right. Yeah, he's the guy that was, uh, uh, I think the book's called Automata. It's this great big fat book, and he talks about how cellular automata works. So he's a neat guy. He did Mathematica. Yes, yep, that one as well. So yeah, he's, he's behind Mathematica, and um, excellent, excellent resource. So there's that. I like Weka. Maybe Weka fits the problem space better, um, at least the problem space as I'm thinking about it better. Um, it is, you know, with, with um, JRuby, you can just bring Weka right in, and, and you're good. And so as long as they have what you want, that's, that's a great solution. Um, uh, Mikhail Brishnikov, a lot of people say he's the best dancer. And he says, I really reject that kind of comparison that says, oh, he's the best, this is the second best, there's no such thing. And I'm thinking, there is no such thing, this is a very complex space to work in, um, what do I need? And then see if you guys need that or would want that too. Um, so my basic idea is that we work in an ecosystem of data and ideas. A lot of things are coming from a lot of directions. I wanted to have a workflow, uh, to provide a, a framework that gives me the workflow um, that I can bring in basically any algorithm and work on that. Uh, without too much refactoring or any refactoring. And any library, if I can bind it to Ruby or find a way to, to get it to talk to what I'm doing, I'd like to use it if it's better. I don't want to reinvent any wheels. And hopefully we're at a point, at least in my noodling at home on the cluster at home, I'm able to get to a lot of pretty neat things with, with Tigu. Um, so that's that. And then to bring it down into a... Um, some sort of environment. What I'm looking at right now is definitely Rinda will be, um, will be there, and then Hadoop is the other one by, by November is the idea. Um, Rinda, you guys heard about it here. Um, they, uh, uh, it's Ruby-centric. It's, it's the Ruby uh, version of Linda, which came out of Yell, which is um, your, your parallel processing. Great, simple, direct approach to do things. Hadoop is a MapReduce environment. So Google came out in 2005 and they said, this is how we're managing all of our major data problems. We're reducing, we're, we're, we're defining a map function that will do something like count lines on a, in a file. And then I, we partition the problem out in, into a, a 2,000 node cluster. And then we run everything in parallel. And then the reduce function says, this is how I combine um, the work that happened. And the thing about the MapReduce framework is that it's, um, it's straightforward and simple. You don't have to really have a background in, in, um, in distributed computing or, or in functional programming to really understand you know, 
how to do something basic at least. Um, but the problem with a MapReduce framework is a lot of the older libraries, they're not thinking in those terms. You don't have a map and reduce. It's not broken that way. You're going to have to do it. And some of the libraries, they, they're really slick. You don't have to think much. You just send in your data, make sure the parameters are set, and bring it back out. So it would be a bit of, a, of an effort to do some of that work in that way. So it kind of depends on your, on your data set and your problem space, what you're going to use. I think I've architected things in a way that we can go in other directions too. And that's kind of exciting. It's, it's, um, well, that comes back to in the beginning, you know, hopefully with the resources you have, we can fit something in there and do something. I should say, I, I think it, maybe it's obvious to everybody you would assume, this is a MIT license. This is open source. This isn't, this isn't anything commercial. Um, so we, I say we as in I'm willing to help. I'm willing to give you time and work with you guys. Not as in I'm trying to sell you my services. Um, Anyway, and then, and then the other exciting thing, I've been, I've been following the Hadoop uh, list, and there's some ideas that came out of here. And for about six months, I've been thinking about how best to, to bring this on to EC2 and the Amazon Web Services and other things. And um, the idea is that by November, I'd like, to, I'd like to have that solid. By about November, my life gets really busy, so things get to be finished. Um, but a lot of what you deal with once you're set up is just your workflow. And I think this offers a lot of flexibility, and it's a generic way to, to deal with, with your problem. Uh, you, you start with a job, or what I'm calling a job. It's a class that, that can handle a job, is what it is, and it's an algorithm. And, and you'll write a directive. We'll see examples in a minute here. Um, you'll write a directive to basically say, here's. Well, we'll go into that in a second. That's basically the last slides. Here's the directive. You'll pass it off to the workload manager. Uh, the workload manager says, I don't know what you're talking about. He'll come back and say, and you can just work in the console, or you can write up scripts, or, or whatever. I don't know what you're talking about. Give me more. And the idea is, let me go to the next slide for a second. This is maybe the best, one of the better ideas here. I'll come back to that last slide. I apologize. I'm a little bit fuzzy in my thinking here. But the, the, the thinking on the ontology is this. There is no one best algorithm for anything. And you don't know them all. And if you're doing analysis, you're doing analysis on what you know, what you're comfortable with. So again, if you're doing some large problem, say the, um, the uh, Netflix competition, you're going to go to what you know, which is what everybody did. And without the collaboration of what are better algorithms, or how could this work, or how does this compare to a different algorithm, um, there is no learning taking place except for did my code work and can I come up, can I come up with a better idea? But that's not the idea but behind Tigu. The idea behind Tigu is if you like and you're using this and you have an algorithm that's new or you came out of the, the academic literature or something that you think could be useful that isn't in the libraries we have so far, submit it. Um, it'll go to Tigu Hub. That's me. I have the domain and the server ready. There's work to be done. But, but then I'll keep a central repository. I'll test your code. I'll run it against some, some standard data sets and publish the benchmarks where the wiki is going to be. So you can basically have an idea of, a good idea of what a lot of different algorithms can do. And a lot of things that you don't necessarily have to start in the academic literature to understand, you can go in a normal, um, uh, layperson terms, read up, this is what it does, and then if you need more information, then there's going to be, you can either get citations or Google it and go from there, or just run it and see how well does it do in your data. Um, but you don't do this manually either. The workload manager goes out and he says, am I up to date on all my job signatures? Do I know, do I know all the ways I could solve this? Um, yes, I am. Okay, good. Now let's look at what he gave me. Maybe I asked for something and I, I, I gave it the specific name of the algorithm. That's easy. He basically says, I've got the name. Can I run this data against that name? No. Do I have a transformation <laughs> algorithm that will go from this data to that algorithm? Yes. You know, it will just basically tree out and figure out, can I solve the problem? Yes or no. Maybe I don't know which specific piece of code I want to run. Maybe all I know is that the method is something like a, artificial neural network or a simulated annealing or, or some sort of other thing. Um, 
or maybe the function is all you know. You just want to classify this in terms of, I need this classified data, or I need to predict this, or I need to search this. So there's just a few general functions that you can do, and then it'll, it'll suggest methods. Um, also data types, and these, it's weird because we're bringing this out of the, the data mining world where they're not talking in terms of a programming language, they're talking in terms of a general idea. So it's a little weird in Ruby to talk about data types because we think about strings and floats and integers, but what they're talking about is it's, it's, a, it's a, uh, um, a tabular data or it's a graph or it's a, a state machine, something like that. Something that you wouldn't expect an algorithm to be able to handle just, you know, it's, it's coming in some specialized format. Um, but we can define whatever we want on, on these. Uh, you come down to the algorithm point, and then you basically say, all right, go, and here's any constraints you might need to run this algorithm. A lot of them need some extra parameters. It could take other models you developed in, in Tegu. It could take hard numbers. You could write an equation right there with Ruby if, if you needed it. I mean, you can kind of work with it and play with it. It's kind of malleable. And then finally, you'll know at least the benchmarks, and the workload manager knows the benchmarks. Because what it does, let me see if I have a slide next. I don't. What it does is it says, um, what am I optimizing for? You, your default is you're going to optimize for popular. At least that's what I'm going to do. Um, whoever's using these algorithms most, use those. But you can optimize for server time, <laughs> calendar time, um, uh, trusted sources. I'm trying to think which other ones I've set up. So you basically, um, you can optimize for various things. And um, you know, if, you, if you've got, say, $10 you want to spend on, on Amazon this, this afternoon, you, know, you, can, you can constrain it to, um, what is that, 10, 10 cents an hour. You, know, you, you, you set up how many hours, server hours you want to, you want to spend, and, and it'll, it'll do whatever it can in, those, in that constraint. There's also an idea in there where it says, um, you've got your execution time to give me an answer. I'm impatient, I'll wait two minutes, or I'll wait 20 minutes, or I'll wait two years, but I've got only so much time I'm willing to wait to get an answer back, but then I have a post-execution time too. And that's exciting because um, the workload manager is actually a temporal difference algorithm. And he's going out to all the different states and he's basically saying, I can run the best, the best way that I know how to give you your work is this way. But if I had these plugins set up on all my nodes, I could have given you a better answer, a more accurate answer, or whatever. So in the post-production time, it comes out and says, well, then I'm going to go do this stuff. You know, if you give me a budget of 20 minutes, I'll go spend that 20 minutes or two hours doing the work that, that should have been done, that would have made this a better run. And um, so kind of ambitious and big, but it's fun. Oh, I said I was going to come back. Let me come back here and make sure I'm explaining how things work, how your lives would work if you're using Tegu. So then you come in. Here's the workload. It'll, it'll generate a model um, for you, uh, which will have a result set and data. And, uh, and then you can just either take the data. That's the answer. You've got the answers go. Or you take the, take the uh, model. Um, actually, I did that wrong. You get a model and you get a result set. Um, I, I did this with, on very little sleep. You have a model and a result set are the two things that come out of it. And you can either run with a model and reuse that in production or in other data. Say you start with your training data and you move into a, a new untested set of data. Or you just take the actual numbers and that's, what, that's all you needed. Um, um, so anyway, that's kind of the idea. The plugins I've explained. Um, so the idea, the whole thing is not we're trying to learn here. As individuals, as a community, um, Tigu, the, the, the workload manager, is going to learn. And so we're, we're trying to change the state. We're trying to change the system that can produce more or less a permanent change in its capacity for adapting to its environment. Herbert Simon wrote that. He's, he's one of the, the big boys in the system science world. He's a smart guy. Um, but you know, that's, that's kind of, you know, if, if we think about that, you know, the, the workload manager knew better, once you run a, a job, it knows better how to run the, the job next time. Uh, once you've worked with, with some data, you know better how to, how to work with it the next time. And a lot of your learning is actually going to be tied back to the lab book. So we're not just dumping a bunch of things in logs, but we're, we're keeping track of, I'm keeping track of, this is the run, this is how long it took, um, this is what you did, this is what you didn't do that fit your, 
your set. This is the information on the wiki at this moment. I store it right now transactionally. I'm just keeping track of the data. It's going dimensional. Basically, it's a, a data warehouse where you're going to be able to say, show me my errors and just work on this. Show me um, the things I didn't do. And you'll be able to parse it and look through it in a console-like environment. Um, the, this winter, I'm going to get to that in a minute. This winter, I'm going to work on a module called Human Elements. Hopefully, the, 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 um, the core, the algorithm core, will be solid and used in different people. And people that are technically comfortable will be using that to get solutions. Um, the Human Elements core will be a, a, a GUI front end written in Flex that's going to give. There's about five or six important tools that will basically take this to the academic world and to the business world. Um, without needing to write Ruby um, in the case that we have what they need, right? Um, and, and part of the human elements will be the lab book. You'll have a good, a good graphical approach to this. So, so what's exciting about that, I think, is that basically um, um, I've got too much data in my space. I have too much to know. And um, I need to be able to focus in and laser in on just those things that affect my results, affect what I would publish or, or recommend to people. And so anyway, that's what the lab book's all about. So remember, we're working, a large work, we're working with a large workbench for, for complex systems. And so I'm trying to make this as easy as possible to, to actually get to some good answers. This is for me to breathe. Every time I practice this, I got pretty excited. I'm, I think I'm tired at this point, but I get really excited about this is what I'm doing and uh, got too excited. So hopefully this won't be a real demonstration. I'll just give you some slides of, of some code and some ideas and then I'll get you some resources um, that if you wanted to, to play around. Um, so the first thing, the idea was uh, we'll work on just, we'll, we'll think about a traveling salesman problem. Um, so that's just the basic idea. If you were a salesman, had 10 cities to, 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 to to visit, um, how do you travel to each city without repeating yourself, and what's the shortest route? Okay, and it's a kind of a common problem in, um, in, in trying to solve this. You know, if you're running trucks, or if you're a lot of things that you, you might need to do that with. Um, and so, for this little demo, we're just going to kind of compare a couple algorithms how this might work in the console. So you might just write a quick distance class, say, just a very simple thing that'll add up an array of numbers. There's nothing special about that except for it, it, it abstracted out your addition. Um, and then your directive might look like something like this. You'd go to the console, you type directive do, budget do. So you don't need all these things, but here's kind of some of the, the features that are working and good. Directive do, um, here's a budget. I'm going to give you, uh, I'm going to name it just be so I can remember, I can, I, can, I can adjust it and template and work with it. So here's a name. And the server time is two minutes. So I'm going to work at a fast pace. I'm going to run something. Two minutes later, I need an answer to know if I'm going in a good direction. If I'm going in a good direction, I might give that more time, depending on my data or whatever. Um, and then I'll set up a job. I'll say, well, the job is, say, this is the, the actual name, a stochastic hill, hill climber. And you might be able to see now what I was talking about, where, you say, where I was saying, you know, you could just sit in here. Well, well the function is to, to classify, you know, or the function is to search or whatever. And it'll go out and figure out all kinds of things. It won't be able to run them necessarily, but it'll, it'll tell you these are the things you can work with. Um, and then because this is evaluating the block, I can actually just pass the class on the stochastic kill climber that says, um, you know, the value for this algorithm is distance.run. And then the data, I just set it up as location. I, I gave it a type of CSV. Uh, there's a data reference in, in, in Tigu. It keeps track of the data that has a, a reader, a writer, and a partitioner that are default, or you can override them. So notice you didn't have to sit here and, and write out, you know, it would be simple in this case, you know, just read a, a CSV file, parse through it, throw it into your, your algorithm. But see, that's the time where you would usually spend your time trying to fit your ideas to this library. And instead, what we're saying is this library knows what it wants. We know our data. Do we already have the pieces in place? Can we reuse them? And I think we can in a lot of times, at least the data I've been seeing. They're, you know, with the same readers, the same writers, the same ideas, you know, it's coming out of databases, it's coming out of flat files, it's coming off the internet. 
in standard kind of ways, and I can reuse my code. Um, and then the job, I, I think I went through all that. So I might run that, I might like the answer, and then I might say, well, there was this other algorithm I was aware, aware of. The other one was a stochastic hill climber, a little algorithm. Well, I just want to try the general hill climbers, just compare the two. And so you would just do the same thing, but directive like last time. So just, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll take all the defaults, faults, then I override the job. I say, well, here's the name and here's the value, you know, a way to compare. And what it's going to do is it'll go and it'll, 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 take, it'll take all your, your, your data elements, it'll add them up, and it'll say, you know, it'll take me 100 miles to go see these 10, these 10 cities. You know, the next time it would run, it'd say, well, okay, I, I could do it in 72 miles. And then it's comparing using this other algorithm. It's, it's doing a, a non-greedy. It's not looking at every possible combination. Um, these algorithms are, are using um, simulated annealing to basically say, I, I'm going to jump around and let some variability help me find something that might not be a mo maximum local or, or a maximum minima or, or maxima. Local maxima, local minima. You can tell I'm nervous still. So that, that's what I can do. You would just say that. And then you might come back and you say, well, I kind of liked that last directive. But let me um, adjust the directive, the last directive, um, and, and, and work with it, but give it 30 minutes instead of two minutes. Um, so there's a lot of just kind of, the idea is that you go to the console and just play some, some back and forth. This is the point where I was going to come into, the, into my console and start showing you guys here, look how it does this and here it does that. But like I said, I got nervous. I broke something. And anyway, you can see if you'd like to see. So what's next? Um, I've got to put my repository up. The repository is, is on this box still. Um, I'll put it up there. And it's just uh, so you can talk and share. Um, the libraries that I have worked with on at least a noodling, you know, I'm, I'm integrating, right now I've got, there's, and these aren't things I've bound yet, there's RS Ruby, excellent. I mean, you can basically take your R code, bring it right into Ruby, and you're good. Um, you know, you, you create a, an R instance, um, and you can pass it the way it is, or you can interact with it in different ways. And it's pretty neat, you know, you can do some pretty powerful things very fast. You know, it, it exceeds my Understanding of statistics, you know, all the things I can do in that thing very, very quickly. Um, Octave is a um, GNU version of MATLAB, and it's got everything under the sun, too. Um, and there are bindings to Octave. Um, the GSL is the GNU Scientific Library, and that is a very, very powerful, large library. FAN is Fast um, uh, Artificial Neural Network. C-based library that has Ruby bindings, very nice. Swarm doesn't have bindings yet. That's one of my other projects coming up. Swarm is a um, agent-based simulation program written by the Santa Fe Institute. And it's a C-based program. I think it was C-based, pretty sure. I've been looking at it and playing with it outside of, of Tegu. And, um, but the basic idea is that, and I haven't demonstrated this well, if you come up with a model by any means, that model will, will encapsulate a way to repeat itself. That's basically all it is. It's going to be a job, but all of the, all of the uh, parameters you needed to get those results, it keeps. And then you can swap out a parameter in your model. So you can take a model and basically say, I ran this, this um, swarm um, here, but let's change the environment a little bit and let's rerun it. Or let's change from training data to, to some new data and see what it does. Or I can take the output of the swarm, say um, some sort of a state space, run some, some statistics on the model. I take the, my swarm model, run some statistics on that model um, to, to, to bring it down into, say, a, media, a mean value. Or um, you're looking at a, maybe do a student t-test and just compare what I was expecting with, with how good my model is. Um, and then just keep, keep combining models and ideas. And you can, anyway, so, so Swarm. FFTW is a fastest Fourier transfer form in the West. So if you're doing continuous data, um, there's a lot of really neat things. This one's written in OCaml. Um, 
And I can't remember. I was committed to bringing it in, but I can't remember if there's bindings on that or not. So basically, I'm going to be spending, once I've got the architecture good, I'm going to be spending a good time binding and working with new libraries. Um, and I've been learning actually OCaml just for this purpose, just because um, it's a functional language. It's a lot of fun that I can write things a lot like I see it in mathematics, and then, um, and then I'll bring it down and, and bind it in Ruby and bring it into, into this environment. So it runs. It runs cleanly, it's quick, it's, it's, it's brief, it's, it's concise in, in its representation, and it's very useful in, in environments far, far removed from, from OCaml. Um, Hadoop and Rinda, um, in experiments, they're, they're good. We're having fun with it. Um, I'll probably end up putting the, um, a lot of the deployment stuff um, into JRuby. Uh, if you're going to go with Hadoop. And I've got to do some tests on that. The way I'm doing a lot of this stuff, to, to make this make sense in, in an environment, there's a great gem, maybe you guys have heard of it, it's called Automate It. It works like a server automation tool like Puppet, or I'm trying to think of other ones you might have heard of. But um, basically, you'll write a recipe of how to install, say, something from source. And you can keep track of all the extra things and you can keep track of how to do it from different, um, different environments. And you're not, you're not um, dependent. You can either use, um, say, a Debian, a Debian package or, a, uh, or whatever, or you can roll your own. And so it gives you a lot of ability to set up the environment. Uh, with Hadoop, that's, that's a big deal. You know, there's a lot of configuration things. But a standard configuration can just be delivered, basically. You know, for me to be able to say from my development environment, um, I didn't have an image set up in EC2 that can do this, but I want to run this thing. Go install on 10 nodes, 20 nodes, this library, and have it written in and reusable. You can sandbox it. So that's what I've been messing with with Hadoop. So I, I need to get it to that level where basically it says, just do it, um, and then you'll have something. And then if you guys need to tweak it, you can take that and just override the, the configuration and say, I want to run my nodes like this. Um, lots and lots and lots of algorithms we need. Yes, Jake? Oh, yeah. You weren't paying attention. <laughs> Hadoop is the map reduce I was talking about. Yeah, thanks. He's a friend. I'm actually rooming with him, giving him a hard time You're here on the conference. Um, yeah, Hadoop is, is um, a MapReduce environment. It's written in Java. Um, it's an Apache project. And it is um, well adapted, uh, accepted by a lot of people. Yahoo has a 2,000 node cluster running. That was the, actually that picture of those computers. That was Yahoo running on Hadoop. Um, so it's definitely not a, a toy. You know, it'll, it'll, it'll handle what you need. It's probably overkill for most of what I need, at least today. Um, but yeah, so that's what Hadoop is. And that's why the commitment and all this time spent getting that piece right. So um, need lots of algorithms. I've got a bunch. I've got a bunch of libraries. But bringing them all into jobs, is that good enough? Do you guys have questions? OK. Um, bringing in lots of, of, of algorithms. And then the human elements that I mentioned earlier. You know, I'll be doing that. Or anybody else that likes that kind of thing, you're, you're, feel free. I did commit. I, I, I think I'll definitely go with Flex on that. I, I don't like JavaScript. Um, I don't like GUI in general, but I know I need it. So uh, if anybody really likes writing that kind of thing, I'll probably write it uh, with Flex with the Karen Gorm micro framework, if you guys have heard of that stuff, what, which isn't a big deal if you don't know Karen Gorm. What's the micro It's called Karen Gorm. It's just basically an MVC on the front end. Okay. It's got seven layers. It's a seven layer bean dip thing. <laughs> so. Karen Gorm, C A I R N G O R M. It's a mountain in Scotland. So it was just the cleanest way I thought I could produce and keep clean a GUI that other people could use. So, anyway, if anybody's interested in that, and I am flexible if people have better ideas than mine, um, it's kind of the big deal is, is, you know, throw it out there, see what better ideas you have, and, and make it available and ch adjust it. So, under consideration, I'm also looking at uh, different ways to do messaging and queues for the clustering, um, possibly even RDF. Um, it's kind of an enterprise-y thing to do, but a lot of the, um, 
uh, the ontology could be formalized and used in other tools. So in other words, I'm thinking about this as I want to come in here and do some different kinds of works, but there's other ways, there's other, other approaches you could do if you're very, um, if, 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 if the ontology, if, if, if all the al algorithms that we can combine are big enough and we really get into this and have a fun time and make a great scientific community out of this or a great, you know, machine learning community out of this, um, RDF might be a, a way to, to kind of get, get to the information quicker, but we'll see. But this is brought to you by a lot of people smarter than me. Um, I've combined a lot of things. I've written a lot of classes and, and figured out, I think, how I can safely give you what you want without giving you, asking you to deal with the details every time differently. Um, so units is just a cool little gem. RS Ruby binds R. Uh, I, I went with data mapper, and I'm not sorry at all. I, I really like that uh, framework. I, I, I need to persist a lot of things that we do here. There's a lot of details I haven't shown you that I need to um, make sure just so that if I need to go back and retrace my steps or I've got an error or, or whatever, I need to defend it, say, on my dissertation when I get to that point. I need to make sure I know what, what I did, you know, that I, you know, that's good. Um, God, we use God and Vlad. I think I'll go with Vlad and maybe Capistrano. Uh, I was working on that actually a little bit last night. I got tired. Um, RGL. Uh, Octave Ruby, Ruby fan, others. Um, resources right now, the one to go to right now is the Google group, groups.google.com slash group slash Tegu. What I'll do is I'll announce there um, when I think the code is good enough that you should play with it, probably this weekend. Um, you can just get it on Git um, when I give it to you. I just what I want to do is at least go through, fix what I broke today, and go through all my to-dos and just make sure none of them are critical anymore. And it'll be alpha for a while, 0 0.1. It's big. It's an ambitious project. But I think it's, um, I think it's justifiable. I kept beating myself up about how monolithic this is becoming. But, but I think that the idea is that if, if, uh, if you can feel comfortable that you understood what you did and that you could use new ideas that you didn't sit down with, then it justifies a monolithic framework. You know, you don't have to know the framework to use it, and um, and I'm trying to be able to to increase the usability quite a bit. So anyway, so that's the idea. I will I will tell on the Google group when I'm ready to go. Um, IRC I've, I've asked for the Tigu dash anything. We'll see if they give it to me on on um, Freenode. I'm sure they will, but. Um, I just I set that up on my computer. Whenever I boot my computer, that opens up. Obviously, nobody knows about it, but you guys. This is like brand new stuff. So you know, you guys know, and my girlfriend knows, and my, my dog knows, right? <laughs> and so um, that's it. But, but the reason I was important for me to do IRC is that um, I, I'm a big proponent on, on um, pair programming. If you're having a hard time, I spend two or four hours every day on this, and so uh, I can commit some of those to, to working with you, training. We can go in and build some features together so you feel like you're, it's comfortable. It's not a, it doesn't have to be a, a lone wolf problem. Uh, Tigu Hub's where everything's going to go. And then Git is, you know, using um, GitHub for that. So I think that's it. Thank you. Any questions? How well did I do? Did I explain anything? Make any sense? I've got a few blank stares and a few excited eyes. Uh, could you just elaborate on the human element part? I just didn't get it. The one. Yes, yes. There are, actually, I'll tell you something exciting. OK. <laughs> lab book is a good thing. You know, the lab book is going to basically needs to be, there's going to be a lot of data on purpose and a lot of even duplicate data, just so you can, you can slice and dice in on what you did, what you didn't do, and justify your analysis. So that's one part of human elements. But there's this other really exciting thing. I didn't even talk about this. OK, once upon a time, World War I, we're trying to figure out how to fight. They bring Thomas Edison into, uh, into the War Department back then. And they say, um, am I doing good on time, guys? Yeah. Do you guys want to go start signaling me? I'll, I'll shut up. Yeah. Do I really? Yeah. Felt like three hours up here. <laughs> So they bring him to the War Department and say, how are we going to fight this war? He says, well, this is what I do in my lab. And he helped out a lot. World War II, we forget all of that. And Rancor, or Air Force has got the same problem. How are we going to fight this war? 
Rand Corporation evolves out of that, and they say this is a methodology for studying complex problems. And there's ways of sharing information. You know, you guys have heard of brainstorming, which is kind of cool but chaotic. Write down an idea, right? And somehow you're going to come up with a better way to do things. Well, there's actually better ways to do things, better ways to get ideas out of domain experts. And so the human elements is big on that, where there's something called, a, well, there's the Delphi system, Delphi method. Um, there's something called ICM. These are basically ways of gathering ideas about how a domain looks and feels. So if you're studying something and you know a little bit about, say you're studying the weather, and you know a little bit about this part of the weather, say, well, you could bring into a room 10 or 15 people and basically say, what do you know, what do you think? And in human terms, or in domain language, in the way that you would talk about it, you're going to be able to gather the nodes of the, the elements of the system. And then at that point, you start playing dynamics. You start playing, well, this touches to this, and this touches to that, and this touches to that. OK, does it really? Run it against the data. Make these into models. Run a, build a model for each one of these up. You know, convene again in, in, in a week. Let somebody go and play with the data and say, you know, it really doesn't fit that idea. Or it really fits that well, but look at, look, we've got a bottleneck here. You know, and you can start to visualize and compare and bring people into a problem um, in different new ways. And actually, you know, I've kind of talked about the analysis core because that's what I've been working on to making sure we have a core where we can get the work done. But the idea is if, you know, not everybody likes programming. Not everybody gets excited about algorithms. So the human elements is, is that. Yeah. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm really excited about that stuff. I'm absolutely committed on making it good. Um, but this has got to be really good first. So other questions, thoughts, concerns, complaints? OK. Tim. Uh, I think this weekend, once I go through all the to-dos, I'll feel comfortable with saying, yeah, go for it. It's not going to break your system. So yeah, I've got, you can run quite a bit with it. Um, the other thing I wanted to do to, for, for sandboxing this is there are some data sets I can, I can make available that you don't have to come up with your own data. You can just say, well, huh, what would this do against that? And, and you can just, just start playing with it and feeling comfortable with it give me ideas on how to make it more natural. You know, I think what I did, I think the class structure is defendable. I might, I'm sure I can improve it, but I think it will do the job. But the DSL, I've got a DSL there that, that I think, it, you know, how natural is it? You know, we need to iterate through that and make sure that it basically, as you're thinking about a problem, you know, let's, 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 give, it some, let's give it some air, so. Oh. I'm going to go to Tigo Hub. I'm not on at the moment, just because I shut everything down just so I wouldn't break the computer. Um, I was a little nervous about that. About uh, last week, I had to re reload my operating system. First time I've ever had to do this on a, on a Mac. And that got me a little nervous right before I came out here. So everything's off, just in case I've got something funky. I write, I, I, I don't write, I, I, I load all kinds of funky libraries on this thing, just seeing, you know, what would this do? Could I use this with Tigo? You know, some of the stuff's old code and some of it, I think, I think what I did is I wrote, brought something in that was just kind of nasty that, that, yeah. It's okay, it's not a well-formed presentation, so <laughs> That would be very exciting. I think I've been having some conversations just this weekend about some of that. And I've been having some conversations. There's a guy back in April out of Stanford Medical that is doing this in Ruby. And um, we're collaborating. So or he's got some good ideas, and he wants to know my ideas. And he, he's excited to, to get together. So I think that's a great idea. Yeah. That's, um, well, actually, that slide, the, the ecosystem slide, was almost pushed on me. I don't, is Dan in here? There's a guy I've been hanging out, I got to know here at the, the conference, and he was saying from that perspective, 
you know, we need to be thinking about this, try this, try that. I'm thinking, great, I'm just thinking, how do I get a good answer? <laughs> so, yeah, that's where's the... Yeah, and you'd basically, you know, wherever environment you're working in, you know, what, what can you do and share, and what would you, at that point, you'd, you would have to find a way to, to do that. But I would absolutely like to, to get it back out. So... Yeah. Exactly. That's, um, I think, very swappable. What you would end up doing, and I hope we, we do this in plugins as well, is you're going to write a reader for that that's going to do some transform, or you're going to write an extract transform load, a full formal thing, um, and you can use that. And it's very swappable. Basically, you would write in the console, use this, and you name the class, and there it is. And then if you put that into a class and you could share it, people could get the same thing. You know, extract transform load is going to be a big deal. I mean, you, you know, once you're using your data, you're getting the same thing over and over. But, you know, it's kind of common per domain how it looks and feels. Um, I had looked a lot at, uh, and I'm not quite sure I'm happy with my decision. I, I left the idea of there's active... Um, Active resource ETL. Active resource and then active resource ETL. And that's an active record based um, gem or two gems that's been around for about two years um, that does really good with what you're talking about. But the support and the community around that seems to have petered. Um, I used to follow that mail list for last year and a half or so. I've been following that one. And, um, and I like data mappers. So I think we're going to end up writing our own readers and sharing them in readers and writers. And, and, and that is something that the, work, the workflow manager is very aware of. You know, you name a data type something obscure CSV the way we do it in our domain, you know, and, and you can assign a default reader, default writer, and a default um, 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 partitioner for it. And, um, and now it's in the namespace, it's in the ontology, and anybody can work with, with what you do if somebody's like you. So. I'm serious what? Definitely. What I do have, it was just a, a monkey patch ha hack at this point, is you can go to any class and ask it for its DSL, and it gives you a list. It helps me keep track of, but it's going to be better than that. Um, and the wiki is going to have to be that, too. You know, there's going to have to be some sort of community-driven documentation that says, you know, this is an obscure algorithm, but it's really got a simple interface. You know, because what we're really talking about is using algorithms like Legos, right? Well, how crazy is that? You know, I mean, and the one buffer you do have is that you know I'm willing to with the cluster I've got. If you send me your repository, your plugins, I'll I'll publish them, but they'll be at least I'll run your unit tests first, and I'll um, and I'll run them against some other data sets, so there'll be some benchmarks. You know, so you have some idea. You know, it, it, it's like fuzzy, fuzzy idea of, you know, you've got a benchmark of how it ran against some kind of data that you might be familiar with. It might kind of give you, give the workflow manager and you an idea that this might be good. But, you know, that's not anything we'll ever get precise on, I don't think, unless somebody smarter than me says this is how we do it. <laughs> so, but, but definitely at least it, it'll be available to, to be able to, to do this. Um, this all seems very interesting to me, but I don't really know much about There is a book coming out for Hadoop. One of the guys in there is writing one. I think he said it was O'Reilly. It's just going to, he's going to, it's going to be a, what do they call that with O'Reilly, the work in progress books? Rough cuts. Yeah, it'll be a rough cut book so you can watch it as it goes. Um, and it's coming, coming along. And he'll deal with a lot of that. Uh, there is an old O'Reilly book called Performance Computing. High performance computing. Um, I'm not as com confident with all that. Yeah, it's like 10 years old now. So there's some things there you might want to at least see it at a library. Um, I've found that Springer, the publishers, they're amazing. Oh, it's, what's the other part of the name? Yes. 
I just remember Springer because I can, can remember that. Yeah, yeah. Basically, you'll never go wrong with that stuff. Um, and they've got a whole set. If you go to a, a university library, um, I would try around um, QA 295, 297. There's going to be huge, huge sets of volumes from Springer that uh, anything you want to know about this, this stuff is there, basically. I mean, not everything, but it's just pretty amazing. Uh, you know, look it up. But, but I'm there a lot just trying to find new ideas. And so, and I'm like learning what I can. I think I'm getting laughed at here because am I just too nerdy or too, too wrong? Or? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's one of my shorthands when people say system science, what is that? QA 295, go look it up. <laughs> but usually 297 is where you start getting more in the data mining. You know, it's down the, down the, down the way. So anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I've closed those libraries. I, I'm, I'm, I'm out of Portland, but I, I grew up in Salt Lake. And kind of the bigger, one of the bigger libraries there is at Brigham Young University. That's where I got my master's degree, or one of my, I'll get it. I have an MBA. Um, so related, but didn't give me the, the meat I wanted, so I went back. Um, so I'm going back there, and it's kind of funny, you know, um, BYU, because uh, they're big on rules. They're really structured, very, very, um, very, very conservative. You know, so when it's time to leave the library, you leave the library. So I've been hanging out of that section a lot of times when, when they're closing it down, and they're just, just, you know, they put on some really, really loud music and just get you out of there quick, because this is the rule, and you're going to have to do it. But anyway, yeah, hanging out of libraries. Uh, questions, thoughts, ideas? Who I wanted to ask, I wanted to make this more interactive, but I couldn't get over my nervousness. I'm a nervous guy in general. Python. I haven't used Sage, but I know that Python is excellent at this stuff. They kick our butts. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, it has like a web interface. In some ways. <laughs> What's that? But Sage actually has like a web interface and a lot of things that you're up. I'll have to look more into that, at least for ideas. One of the big libraries I'll be working with in Portland, um, they did everything in Python. I've been trying to convince the professor, let's switch. Let's switch this to Ruby because the guy that's been maintaining it is leaving, and I'll be maintaining it, and let's do it right. So let's do it with Tigu. <laughs> so right before the summer, I said, this is this great thing, and it's going to be announced in Austin, and there will be support in the open source community, and it will reduce your workload by so much if we switch this. So. You know, hopefully he'll let me throw away his stuff, and you know I'll just use the C++ libraries and build from there. Python is excellent with this stuff. I looked at Haskell, and I kind of decided that I wanted things my way, and I was a little timid. There's so much I'm learning. I thought OCaml was enough for now. So Haskell's really good at keeping, you know, some of this this. Uh, well, Erlang too, you know, and, and I've been, um, I spent probably three months making sure I wasn't being silly, and I probably am. You know, there's a lot of qual qualitative decisions that were made, um, but I, I feel comfortable with where I'm at so far. And I've been asking a lot of people, maybe people know, it would be cool that if we need to extend this with some of these languages or play or rip out major sections, how fun would that be, you know, and, and how easy would that be? So I'm pretty draconian sometimes with, you know, throw away a lot because I don't like it anymore and make it make it perfect so or better. But anyway, um, I was gonna say something I forgot what it was. Yeah, I was gonna ask who's who's excited about who who would find that this would have something to do with their regular workflow or work life or okay. If you guys want to get involved or help me out or um, tell me where I'm dumb, you know, or, or whatever, or, or pair program or anybody, but, you know, I just kind of wanted to see faces so that if, if we did happen to start collaborating, I've got a possibility of knowing who we are. But, um, you know, I'll give you, I'll give you up to four hours of my day. I still have to make a living and I still have to um, learn something at school and 
get passable grades. <laughs> so, um, but you know, if you want to just get in together and, and rub shoulders and write something, you know, especially because there's going to be so many algorithms that maybe you're already using or you need to have, it's pretty minimal to, to write up a job. You know, you just have to, the, the interface is you've got run, run, map, and reduce are the three methods. And if you're going to be able to run in Hadoop or in a map reduce, you know, you got to have map reduce, and otherwise just run it. And then you've got to find a signature, which will have any parameters and things you need. Um, that's there's four things you need. And so you can take whatever classes and objects you're already using and just subclass Tigu job and give me those four things and it'll run. But the signature is really, really important. Well, they've got pi. Well, they've got streams, which uh, I, becomes pipes. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's there's probably a lot we need to look at. They do have. If I can't do it in JRuby, I wanted to do it in JRuby because I was getting frustrated. There's something called streams, which is a socket interface that you can bind. Um, so it's getting into your, your Java um, through streams, and then pipes is, is, is the binding. So I can bind to Ruby pipes um, and then just play in that interface. But what I'm hearing a lot is that there, there are some limitations with what they let you do through that interface. And so naively, I would wanted to consider JRuby. That's partly why it's got to be done basically in the next month or else I'm going to get really busy. It's, it's, it's got to get done. But, um, but I was naively hoping that with JRuby, I might be able to just get the real pure Hadoop. There's two things. There's pipes, and there's, because see, you're running in, you're running the jobs through pipes, or pipes to streams to Hadoop. And then there's a, a distributed file system, the HDFS, that they have. And, um, you can figure that up, and that's pretty nice. But but uh, that one I've heard is also limited. But that one's also they've got a binding to that as well. So we can just go that route if we have to stop at that point, and that might be simpler or easier. Or we can take on something else. So but there is definitely there's definitely a way to get it done, and it shouldn't be more than a a, a weekend to have an alpha something done on that. But um, and see, and that's going to be critical too if you're going into the EC2 space. Um, to have both Rinda and um, Hadoop available, you know, and Rinda I think is basically because you can run mon you can run a monolithic process of any type, whatever your libraries are, wherever you're coming from, just run it as a service and you're good. And then if you can get it down to a MapReduce, you can probably use your resources more efficiently. Um, and then if we want to go with a different parallel system as well, I mean, there's probably a lot of other things outside of that. <laughs> And if some of you guys are kind of locked into an approach, let me know. I think that it shouldn't be too hard to take what we've got and, and, and at least find a way to get it done. So we'll see. I don't know. I know, I know it'll be uh, used for a very broad variety of problems. Have you, have you chosen any uh, sort of applied pet problems to, to try it out with as a proving ground? I want to predict the next president. <laughs> um, that's just, you know, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, just because that lends it so well, you get the pull results and you can build models and layer things and noodle about why is the dynamics going the way they are, you know? And then you could ask things about not just how is this platform working with this population, but how is uh, how is the negative ads, and how you know how you know? I mean, you could you could come up with models and ideas about you know keeping people from the, the polling places. So I would love to do that, and I think I can at least have a more informed opinion than CNN would give me. Maybe I'm hoping to get that far. 
Um, especially if it's a close one, that would be a lot of fun. And the other one is, um, I'd love to see if I put my hand in the, um, in the um, Netflix competition and see if I can do any good. If anybody else wants to do that, that might be a lot of fun. Yes, I got that. Yeah, so we're coming down to basically, I got to go through all my to-dos. We'll release this. If you guys want to play on your own or with me. You got two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I would love to do that because that's a very broad spectrum of algorithms and ideas and classifications and comparisons and, and just to see how, you know, let's, let's, let's take this thing for a drive. So Netflix this month, election next month, and then... <laughs> World domination, is that? <laughs> no, yeah, um, there's going to be with the genetic stuff, I think I'll be right hand in hand with that. And I think this is solid. I was approached by a professor up there in Portland that said Wells Fargo needs some of the analysis we do at Portland State, and they're hiring us, and we might be able to get uh, Tigu to work on that, um, at least with some of his algorithms. Um, and I'm going to go back. I used to consult for another bank uh, right before I went to school. I was consulting at a data warehouse group, and uh, I'm going to hit them up, see if they'll hire me to, to do some things. Their guy is a, he has a master's degree in applied, sci uh, applied mathematics, and uh, he's big on analysis, and he wants to do more and more of that. He loves the small, agile, and that's the thing, too, about this. You can just do a small, agile, little analysis without reinventing the whole world. So. Yeah, maybe Zines will, will want to do some interesting things, but. Yeah, where I'm going with that is if uh, it struck a chord with anyone who's interested in a particular area you might be, you know, trying to break ground on first. Yeah. So yes. Oh yeah, that's probably a great, great thing. Yeah, I'll be doozy using um, the algorithms I need to use on that. There's something called reconstructability analysis, which is just a way to cut down the the the, the the problem space. Um, it uses information to figure out what's information theory to figure out what what might be a good good models, and then I'll run my models. And I wanted just for for sanity's sake, if anybody's interested, non-monotonic reasoning, which is basically um, a non um, a non um, probability based reasoning system that says um, this is typically that, and that is typically this. You know, a, a bird typically flies, and penguins typically don't fly, and roasted birds typically don't fly. You know, that kind of thing. So it's just basic, a, a basic classification. But to be able to put that in there, because how fun is that to be able to say, well, you know, all my models are possible models. Let me give them a non-monotonic connection, and then it can infer from there um, what other things it does or doesn't know, and help me help me manage the model space better. So that would be a fun thing to do. And that's just, I think it's just going to run that and probably dynamics and some of the other things will just run like any other job. You know, it, it happens to work with lots of models, but it's just another job, you know, another thing to do. So that's some of the areas that I, I think would apply well, especially like, you know, with something like with the presidential election, you know, I can sit down in English terms, say these are, here's a classification of how it might work and then test it and see it. So. Yeah, lots of neural nets, lots of bays, lots of other classifiers, lots of things. Who knows? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> lots of frustration and coke. <laughs> other thoughts, ideas? Are we good on time? You want to go? Got six minutes. I started ten minutes early, so you got a four-minute bonus. <laughs> All right. Thanks, you guys. Video equipment rental costs paid for by Peepcode Screencasts.